So it is Monday, April 19th, 2020. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. All commissioners are present. Uh, in addition, uh, General Manager Sullivan is here and Sean Enterline and Steve Farman from FEPSA. Are, are, and Jessica. And Jessica. Sorry, Jessica. <laughs> we need your it's picture. It's okay. I'm visual. Um, okay, so a quorum is present. Um, are there any modifications to the agenda? Uh, hearing none, um, all in favor of approving the agenda? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, hearing only ayes, uh, the our agenda is approved. We have several minutes from previous meetings to approve. Um, there were some small mistakes in, in, in the previous minutes, so Jess reissued them. Has everybody looked at them? No. I haven't looked at the new one, but you probably addressed the same things I had written down. Okay, let's take the minutes one by one. And we're talking then about the revised minutes, which were, were issued this afternoon. So is there a motion to approve the minutes? Actually, we could do them. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the 9th of November, 2020? No. I so move. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So the minutes from the 9th of November are approved. Uh, we have minutes from the 21st of December. Is there a motion to approve? Moved. Second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any objection? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. And then we have minutes from the 18th of January. Um, is there any objection? I'll do it that way. It'll be faster. <laughs> Hearing none, the minutes from the 18th of January are approved. And then we have minutes from the meeting of the 15th of February. Is there any objection? No. Hearing none, the no. minutes are approved. Those minutes, by the way, are the original minutes that were attached to the board package, as opposed to second round minutes. And then we have minutes for the meeting of the 15th of March. No. Is there no. any objection? Wait a minute. Um, let's see. I just oh, want to make sure I'm looking at the updated ones here. Okay. Do, do you mean 15th of February? No, I mean the 15th of March. Okay. Yeah, it looks like the corrections were made. Okay. No. Okay, uh, hearing no objection, those minutes are approved. And so Jess, when, when those go on the website, it should be the ones that you sent out today. Yep, um, I can do that. Rather than the attached ones. Um, and I can, I can come by sometime this week and, and sign the minutes. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Um, Okay. Yes, you can sign them for me and just initial it. I can do that. Okay. We have no uh, members of the public present, so um, there is no public comment, which takes us to the annual budget review. Um, there. So I'm, I'm just thinking what the best way to, to do this is, and I think there were questions that had come in from Roger and from Vince. Uh, so I think it makes sense to take those first. Um, so yeah, Roger, Vince, did, I'll defer to you, Vince, in terms of did, did your questions all get answered? Did some of them need discussion on the call? Uh, they almost all got answered. There are a few that I had a couple of additional questions. Uh, I don't know if you want to go through those now or. Yeah, why don't you do those? Why don't you do those first, and then we can. Then I'll. Then you can turn it over to mine. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, 
uh, I guess I was, uh, I had a question about implementation of AMI and, and actually just gathering what the schedule is for being able to just gather data remotely. As an interim step, you mean, Vince? Uh, actually, as a uh, final step for being able to, well, actually, this uh, this may this be is, more detailed Vince, question. Vince, that, may I interrupt you? This is for next year. And and so we're not putting in, unless, I, unless I've missed something, in which case I've missed a big thing, um, I'm not aware that we have a plan to put in remote meter reading capability for the okay. next I, the, year. The, the way, the reason I ask is because of the amount of uh, infrastructure labor that goes into actually collecting data that could otherwise be, I, I guess that is a, a discussion for the future, but uh, I just wanted mm -hmm. to, I guess it led to that question. So, so okay. yeah, you, you're right. I, I, think, not, I think, I think that's, it's, it's something to discuss as, as a longer term project. Right. It's not but, germane to the, yeah. Okay. But for next year, I, I, we've just got so much to go through. Sure. Okay. So let me let me just give you kind of a one minute blurb on that, all of you. Uh, so VEPSA uh, initiated an RFP and an eval on uh, an AMI system, a joint action AMI system for all of VEPSA, and I was on. I am on that committee, uh, and we started with I believe twelve vendors. This has been a, over a two year process now, and getting down to the point where we've chosen our vendor, we've chosen the product, uh, and we're doing the cost benefit analysis per utility. So Hardwix is not done yet, but when that is, uh, I'll have a full presentation for you on that, uh, on this uh, two plus year process. So yes, things are brewing vents. Um, from the regulatory standpoint, our regulators and our legislators are really pushing towards uh, putting cards in place that will force us to implement AMI uh, to push forward uh, EV efforts and other uh, renewable goals that the state has. So we're trying to be uh, proactive and get ahead of that curve rather than reactive and have them tell us, oh, you have until tomorrow to get that implemented. Uh, so we are working on it and you will be hearing a lot more about it in the near future. That's great. That actually answered a whole bunch of a whole bunch of questions. That, that includes uh, remote, not just sensing, and but uh, controls also. Correct. Yes. Right. Um, uh, let's see. Bear with me for a second. Uh, deciphering my notes. Uh, Take your time. It's not okay. a race. I'm on. I'm on island time. I'm in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a margarita. <laughs> yeah, you're probably you're probably half drunk. No, I'm not. I'm not a diver. <laughs> I might be later. Uh, island time. Uh, Nine twenty-six. Point five one. Let's see, twenty six point five and five one. I just wanted to know from which accounts those were moved. Uh, okay, I mean, it looks like the the accountant, the accounting company recommended that that be um, reallocated to a separate account. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, so that came out of nine twenty six oh one. Okay. Okay. And I think I'll, I'll, that's because I think that's because they want it split out as its own liability on the books, correct, Jeff? Correct, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Which makes sense. Uh four zero eight point seven. I just want to know uh, how the payment in lieu of taxes was calculated. I mean, who calculates that, uh, where that number comes from? The town and Hardwick Electric agreed on that, I believe, in 2010, Jess? Somewhere around um, there. Was it 2010 or 11? One, one or the other. 
It was just before I came. And the only thing that's changed on it, Vince, is that the uh, Billings Road property used to be included in that. And it was essentially zero because the town uses it for their gravel, for all their gravel needs in the winter and construction and whatever. Uh, but that piece has actually dropped off since I joined Hardwick Electric. So if anything, it's reduced from what it was. And right now we pay zero tax for that 320 acre parcel. And that hasn't changed since I think that expired in 2014. So we haven't paid tax on it in some time. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I got your, your thing, seller income account. What is it? I, I couldn't figure out what it was either. So <laughs> never mind on that one. Um, I, I did want to try and get a number for the, uh, the value of actual expiring credits. Like I, I know you said that most of them are used, so it, it ends up being, ends up zeroing out, but, uh, actually getting a number would where where are you in the but where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Four point four zero point zero three. I mean four 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 zero point zero three. Okay. So maybe just on an annualized basis, the uh, the total value of actual expired credits that aren't um, that aren't used. Do you have any feedback on that one, Jess? Well, we are in the process of working actually. We have a meeting tomorrow um, to get the our bills printed that would show the retiring credits on it. Um, I'm also working with SEDC to get a full breakdown every time we do billing of each type of credit, whether it's the rec credits or the siting adjusters or the excess generation credits. Um, for getting a report like that uh, every month, so we'll be able to figure out what the expiring credits are from there, hopefully. Awesome. awesome. Love data. Data is good. Yeah. So uh, just uh, Jess is always working on some fix or patch or making something better than it is now. And one of the things she's working with SEDC on is supplying <laughs> some more data to the customers, actually per a, a, a specific customer request that was made um, for some additional data that she's talking about. But this, you're actually talking about something above and beyond that piece. And I don't know, Steve, are you listening to this and do you understand the question? You're muted, Steve. I know I am. Um, I just couldn't okay. find the mute button. <laughs> um, I understood what Jess was saying. I'm not sure I understood what yep. the question Vince, was. ask your question again and maybe Steve can shed a little more light. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, so on a yearly credits expire on an annual ba rolling basis after a year uh, and i guess uh getting a getting an amount for the total number of credits that expire um that aren't used the net metering credits on an annual basis i mean that because that, that would could have substantial value because it ends up not being a liability you know it ends up being a okay so that that is exactly what jess is talking about i'm sorry okay yeah. So she is working yeah. on exactly that. Yep. Yeah. Right. So when those expire, it takes the liability back off your books. It's kind of a non-cash transaction at that point, but it right. does reduce the liability. You have to figure that out by month because it's a rolling 12 month thing. But if you track it by month, right. at the end of the year, you can add them up and that's your, yeah. end of the year, your yearly sure. totals. I think she's going at that just right. And if yeah, she's actually, if SCDC She's been working on this for her at least a couple of months now, right, Jess? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're in the last stages of getting the a graph that's going to go on the – tomorrow we're working on the graph that's going to go on the back of the customer's bill, that metering bill, cause, so it's going to give them all their information now, um, what the adjustment was made, um, how much bank, how much retired or expired, sorry. Um, so that'll be right on the customer's bill. And being that that information is now going to be on the customer's bill, it's going to be accessible for us to get on a report. But right. until we got it accessible to be on their bill, we couldn't get a report from it. Right. And, and, and effectively, I mean, if there are, 
I mean, effectively, it reduces the the amount that Hardwick Electric has to credit per kilowatt hour. You know, if you have say 10% of the net metering credits expire, then uh, what the net actual net metering cost ends up being less. But so, Jess, if you just for a for a sanity check, if you had to take a guess at how many credits actually expire, I'm guessing that number is extremely low. Very low, very low. Yep. And we have customers who have called and asked, you know, and we can, we go back and, and rarely have we found anybody who their credits have actually expired. Because the winter time, you know, because a lot of them are putting in the electric heat. They're putting in the Right. So they, they haven't, right. they don't lose it anymore. So they might have something after their first full year, but then they say, well, I'm going to put in an extra air conditioner or whatever and use those credits. Or, or they become I a think group. That's what's happened. Right. Or they have a bunch of extra credits and they put a heater outside. To exactly. See <laughs> whatever. Use them up. Yeah. Or a hot tub like that. All right. Uh, that was, that was it. Those are the only questions I had. Thank you. Roger. Oh, Lynn. Okay, I'll I'll jump in. So um, the budget summary page and the cash flow forecast that Jess uh, created um, was uh, just perfect for me. Starting with the summary page, uh, Mike, you had referred to in some earlier times there had been a format that hadn't been that useful to to commissioners. I want to make sure the other commissioners, when you saw what Jess sent out. Um, that works for you. It, it, it did for me. So I, I propose that we just, as a matter of course, we'll just have that. Those two sheets can be our first two sheets. And that way you can kind of absorb the big picture and then drill into the detail on each line item. And it's, uh, that's terrific. So really good. Is everybody, um, everybody okay with it? Yeah. Any yeah. suggestions? Yeah. yeah, it was really helpful. So um, the, um, the next area just in the in that we talked about, and I think Mike, you gave us all an answer, but was the suggestion that we as a group take stock of our long-term debt. I, you know, I forget about it. I don't know, a couple of years ago or something it was mentioned, or certainly when we've looked at audits, it's been accessible, but it probably rounds out the whole picture, you know, of, of what our, in effect, what our, our liabilities are that we're yeah, working. Yeah, one of the things, one of the things, Roger, that um, not just our last auditor, but our, actually our previous two auditors have said is that you guys are, should be going through those annually. Yeah. Uh, re, you know, actually having them as an agenda item and reviewing them together. Right. And, um, you know, that, that, that hasn't happened. And, okay. you know, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a good first step. Uh, and I, you on, know, in, on the in, process. In, and if you and if Jess has a time of year when it's harder or easier, if it's accessible, throw it in with the budget package. If it's not accessible, just um, if you could, if we don't remember to ask you, if you can just, as a matter of course, include it. And and part of the reason I suggest it is, um, you know, we may at some point to make a step forward to comply with what you're working on with new improvements that might be mandated. We might have to borrow more or we may be in a position someday to pay down debt and to kind of know what's the cost of our debt, what's the, the amount and the cost will help us develop a point of view on how eager we'd be to pay it down or how eager we'd be to borrow more. So uh, that was the only, that was just the motivation. So let me, let me ask you a question on that, Roger. Would it make mm -hmm. more sense to, it seems to me that it would make sense to have a board policy or something that that gets looked at in the third quarter of the year. That way it's in your head when we're coming in time to maybe making our budgets. Sure. I mean, we're late, we're late this year, but then yeah. you would have it fresh in your mind. And honestly, I'm imagining that it's, it's only uh, a handful of numbers. Like it wouldn't fill up half or right. third of a pack. So heck, you might, you might just stick it in your monthly pack, you know, I mean, if it's if it's only a few numbers and it's hanging around, but I don't know it, that we really need to see it that often. It, it's literally down to a few things. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, Lynn, is that that 
solid. Is that that's what you had? No, you're you're all no no. I was just confirming that. On yes the yes. Deck. No, I I think that okay. makes sense. The other the other questions as we went through, I think they were all addressed. I, I think Lynn, you were gonna, you'll you'll work on some of the the salary questions, um, that both Vince and I, I think raised them, and then we got generally since we first went through all the expense items, the answers were great, so I don't need to drill into that. We got to the revenue, and my question on the revenue, which is we appreciate having you, Sean was more coming from the place of, um, you know, every year, you, it's kind of like a sport. Every year you do a budget, you know you're gonna get revenue wrong. I don't care if it's a nonprofit, a for-profit, manufacturing, whatever kind of business it ever is, you never get revenue right. But you try like the Dickens to get it right because your whole budget hangs together a lot better if you're, if you're as close as you can be. So when I eyeballed it, I looked at it and I said, gee, I don't understand. Because usually the best indicator of what your revenue is going to be is your most recent period. And then you adjust up or down based on what seemed weird in that period. And, and I couldn't quite wrap my mind around it. I felt like, gosh, we're kind of at a run rate here. We're cruising along at a higher level. So why, why budget? And then it leads to a question. As soon as you answer that, it causes all of us to ask the question, well, what if we're wrong? You know, is our coverage, how badly will we get hurt if we guess wrong or guess high? We will be wrong, but, but what are the implications of being wrong? And I'm new enough to this that I don't really, I can't really calibrate in my head those implications. <laughs> if they don't matter, you know, if the implications are minor, then it's a minor question. But if they're, but, it, but if, you know, if you start getting off. So then I, I asked the question, I did, I looked at the numbers. I said, if it looks low. And then I asked the question about, you know, our first two months of the year, are we tracking low? And I saw in Mike's report that came out that indeed we are tracking low. So if you can comment on it, uh, I'm not necessarily pushing to change the budget. Maybe we should or could. That's a lot of busy work, but I definitely want myself and the whole board to understand What's the implication? Because it looks like we're, we've right now got a budget that is low on revenue and we're gonna be higher. So what was the thinking? And then what is the thinking for what that means to us? Sure. Um, <laughs> trying to decide whether just to dive in or give you pictures. Let me, let me offer the pictures as the second uh, okay. option. And I'll just talk process briefly. Um, you're right. The most recent year of history is often your best indicator of what happens in the following year. Um, but because electricity use is so well correlated with weather and with your customer counts, uh, what we end up doing in practice is running a regression model with 10 or 15 years worth of history. And so we get this longer term trend of customer counts and the normalized weather and I emphasize normalized because weather never comes out normal, and that is your largest source of variance in many years. Um, last year was particularly tough. We took a look at the way loads changed during the spring quarantine, and we just ultimately concluded that that's an outlier. We don't expect it to happen again. And so we threw it out. We literally said, we're going to stop our historical data in December of 2019. So okay. I, I validated everything you said because it's almost always true, but this year we did not use 2020 okay. very deliberately as a, uh, a data point to inform our models. Um, if, if you guys would like to see a picture, you can see how closely aligned the model falls to history. I've got a nice animation. It, it helps, but it's not necessary. If, if the narrative is sufficient, I'm happy to move on to the question of what are the risks if you're too high or too low? Why don't I tackle that? And then we'll go to the pictures if it's, there's still some questions hanging on. So, you so with respect to, go ahead. I'm sorry, so I just wanna make sure I'm following you. So you took out 2020 entirely from the yes, analysis. We have no history. 
Right. And that was for every, so that was for every customer. Do you do the regression separately for each customer class or do you do it for the system as a whole and then allocate across customer classes? <laughs> it's the latter. Great question. Yeah, when we have more data and AMI, we'll be doing it by customer class up. But right now we do it from the top level and then disaggregate down to the class. What do you do though when you add meaningful customers, not a residence, but you know, when Jasper Hill steps up or, or the, you know, you have a new industrial user like our hemp processors or uh, that seems to have happened a bit in the last year or so. So uh, a historical regression would kind of miss that. It definitely would. There are four major adjustments we make to the regression model. So the regression creates this nice smooth curve and generally it's pretty believable. Uh, the first adjustment we make is for net metering. Uh, that is the biggest adjust, single adjustment we make. Um, it's about 2,000 megawatt hours a year out of a 39,000 megawatt hour year regression forecast. You net that down and you get into the 37,000 megawatt hour year uh, range that your current budget is in. Uh, we also adjust for uh, expected cold climate heat pump and electric vehicle growth. As you would expect, those are very, very small. We're talking, you know, maybe 100 megawatt hours a year of movement. So it's really not very detectable uh, unless you're doing the numbers on a spreadsheet like I am. And the fourth thing you just mentioned, you know, if there's a significant new customer, I do send out email outreach to all of our VEPSA members each fall prior to our load forecast inquiring about just that. and. Uh, if we know of a large new customer that's coming on, we will add that uh, load. Sometimes we don't, I don't know about them, but like, for example, Roger, when the hemp processing facility came in, that landed in Sean's equations and evaluations. Great. What, what are the driving variables in, in the regression that you're running? I mean, is it, a, is it a multivariable regression or is it time series analysis? Uh, to me, those are largely the same things, Len. Uh, okay. Forgive me if I'm missing a distinction, but uh, the, I'm just going to a table here in my uh, methodology because this is very current. Uh, um, we use monthly variables to capture seasonality, literally ones well, and I have to help you share, share your screen, Sean. Yeah, <laughs> that would help. I'll make you the host. Does that do it? Uh, that usually does the trick, yep. There you go. Yes. All right. Uh, let's see here. Screen two. There. So this is just an excerpt from your upcoming 20-year plan. And you asked, Lynn, what are, what's driving the, the forecast statistically? There are these dummy variables that capture holidays, that capture monthly seasonality. Those are very important. Uh, we, we model unemployment uh, from the Vermont Department of Labor. That's both a historical and a forecast series. So a source of um, uncertainty this past year with COVID in the economy was unemployment in Vermont was incredibly depressed for a short time. And you can see that number right up to the present, uh, largely due to the fact we're so tourist driven, particularly in the winter. So that's a source of error. It's not just a historical series, it's a forecast series that we get from the Department of Labor. What goes with that is drink, eating and drinking sales. Um, not all systems have enough. We don't do that. There. Do. Yeah, so it's not big. Energy efficiency can be large. This is efficiency Vermont activity, both historic and forecast. And then I already mentioned weather. Those are the four major categories. So you're you're referring to much larger data sets, and then and then interpolating uh, specifics to Hardwick Electric. Yes and no. It's both. Uh, maybe a better answer is both. Definitely referring to much larger data sets, but many of the data sets are very specific to Hardwick. Uh, you know, the weather is is the adjacent airport, for instance. Your energy efficiency numbers are. Um, made as specific as possible to you. Um, of course, your load itself is uh, obviously your 
hours, but yeah, it's a mix. So, Are so, we? I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, was unemployment specific to us or was that um, for the state or the county? I think that's at the, I'm trying to remember if that's at the county level or one level up. Which way is uh, it? Up? Forgive me. Is, is Meaning, up to... it's not, we don't meant up means the state or, or a census region. Um, Burlington has its own little census region, for instance. We're not modeling that uh, for you. Uh, so it could be state. I'm almost certain it's a subregion of the state, but I can't remember what granularity it's at, Lynn. So, and what's the your like new data collect collection process for Hardwick Electric, and on uh, what frequency do you update the the model? The model granularity is monthly, and so we have metering on your uh, system loads. Uh, through all of our ISO and Velco settlement reports. So that's the granularity we're working with. Unemployment fits nicely into that monthly granularity as do the seasonal variables, of course. Um, okay, I was thinking about well, like, the specific like uh, implementation of solar or heat pumps or stuff like that. I mean, that, uh, I've, I've solar just- monthly. Okay. Yeah. And I should, I should, Pause on solar, you know, ideally we have measured use and generation on all of this stuff. In the case of net metered solar, uh, we don't have direct metering on all of it. And if we do, it's at the billing cycle level, not a clean calendar month. So what we frequently do is take the installed capacity of solar, which is a very firm, well-known number. And because we know uh, the solar insulation, forgive the term there, that's just the amount of sunshine you get every month on average. Uh, we project actual uh, solar use. We don't actually have a historic metered data set on that. So there's, but there's that's a lot a problem. of <laughs> what, whether that data. suggests, but that that's that kind of suggests that that's a weak link for us methodologically because we, we budgeted 125 thousand for net metering in 2020, and our actual was 320. You're talking about the revenue forecast now? Uh, that's all we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I get focused in on my corner of it here. I want to get to the net metering. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Oh, net metering doesn't show up as a subset here. Um, forgive me, Steve. I'm going to need your support here. They don't, can... they, uh, VEPSA doesn't see our budget right now. So they're not, I'm sure they're not understanding what you're meaning by the 350. I think well, I understand. I thought I it came. The number. <laughs> so who did the 350 come from? The 350 came from our, the, the actual of 320 in 2020. And mm -hmm. I know that as of right now, we have 12 more solar arrays coming back up, coming on the applications that are sitting out there pending. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do know that we do have two larger than 30, what was the, in on the, in on the, that was a 34, right, Mike? One's a, we have one 34 coming online, or in, in the uh, permitting process, and Jasper Sellers has put in to put a new 150 on their, uh, the big addition they're putting on up at the Sellers. So not only just, did, so not only did it the application, and, the, uh, Oh, what's a uh, center road? Something for center road too. We just oh, got yeah, that that's, today. That's that's a that's a developer project. That's good for us. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to let you know we got that application today. Yeah. Okay. But, so maybe but, maybe we should go back to the Vepsa stuff. But I I just confirm that that um, as a separate discussion, not directed to Sean, but but to Mike and Jess and. And I don't understand the detail variables, but I would wager that our 350 is dramatically low. If, if 2020 was 320 and many of those systems, and we really doubled our systems and they came on during the year and now they're running the full year and then we're layering in yet new systems, there's no way we can be at 350. You know, what? just the trend, the trend line is pointing to a completely different outcome. So that's why this discussion's good, because I mean, 
hey, forecasting, everybody's wrong all the time, but we want to be as right as we, we just want to, I wanted to understand the methodology and then I'm going to suggest that that's a place where I think we could improve our methodology. Just, just, it's pretty granular. There aren't thousands of data points. You know, you can kind of look yeah, at when I, they went I think in. The, I think the 25,000 would have made sense. The 25,000 added into the budget would have made sense, but for this 30 plus KW and the 150 KW, 150 won't be online in this budget. It won't be till next year. Okay. So we're really only missing, the, the anomaly is this 33.4 KW unit that's going right in the village. So, but okay. you're, you're, you're legit, Roger. We, we are low, I agree. Yeah, and part of my reaction is also that last year's budget, you know, the order of magnitude of miss between 125 and 320 is, you know, they're kind of in different... <laughs> Yeah, but we get, we got yeah, out of this world bombarded last year with net metering projects. Well, totally. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to understand why our actual why our budget was so low in 2020. That's what I when, just said. When our actual in 2019 was 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 right. higher, was that a weather driven thing, or we just sure. we just screwed up? Yeah. Uh, we had uh, Novus come online. We had oh, right. Wolcott Solar come online. We had that's uh, six hundred and fifty kW right there. No, no, that's not, that's not that's not my point. Why? What I'm saying is, why did did why did our methodology fail to forecast accurately? No, what I'm saying is that our our forecast for 2020 was less net metering. Than what we actually had in 2019. When I when I look at line 40.03, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I mean that's not the bulk of the of the addition the for 2020, but it's 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 part of it. So we didn't go from 125 to 320. We went from 160 to 320, which is still a huge increase. Right. Mm -hmm. So how many, um, how many project additional, I mean, how many total projects did we gain in last year, Jess, roughly? Hold on just a second. And, and when in the year did each one come online? Because then you have to fully annualize right. those systems. And then you add the new ones when you think they're going to come online. Well, and the new ones are going to be coming in at a slightly lower rate, aren't they, Mike? It, yes. It, you know, we're going to be paying but, them less. But Roger's right. You have to annualize that. And I Absolutely. think that's, I think that's where the gap is, Roger. Okay. So look, this is, this, I, I think that the call to action on this is to sort of have a, a spreadsheet detailed methodology where you go, you sort of build it up one at a time. You take all the ones that are just existing and you, those roll forward and then you layer in the new ones and fully annualize the ones that came in during the prior year and then make a guess as to the new ones coming in and and I so I think it'd be good for us to I don't think I'm out mean, we have to based on what Lynn just pointed to the amount of the the error between the budget and the actual we have we have to do better and I'm and I'm I'm convinced that this year is a lot more likely to be over 400 than to be under 400. So we're gonna, we've got an order of magnitude under budgeting. Mm, I bet it'll be 350. I bet it won't be 400. Okay, well, we'll find are out. The, uh, are the That's projects, the fun of all this. We'll find out yeah. in the end. Are the projects forwarded to VEPSA for budgeting uh, when they're received or when they're actually permitted? Sounds like it's local, not VEPSA, right? Right, no, it it's, is local. A, it's, a, it's local, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm not, well, you know, well, exactly. Um, I know that we did have some that, um, oh, they changed their group and changed, you know, took, took some residents out and put in a couple, so they moved to, oh, how to, they changed their group, so they took some residential customers out and put in some commercial customers. But that wouldn't have been that much of a difference. So 
I'm not exactly. I'll have to go through my budget papers for 2020 to see where I came up with the 125. Yeah, no, I I think Roger hit it on the head. I think it, we didn't annualize it right. Right. And let and be careful on that. I only grabbed hold of that one because that's where the big numbers were. I think net metering all these smaller categories too. Whatever we do to to improve our net metering on that one residential line, the biggie. Let's do it. Let's do the same good methodology for all all those net metering. What are there four of them? Yep. So if I can slide in before you move forward from there, Sean, I, I'm curious if, I mean, Hardwick Electric is over 80% residential customers. Does that make uh, your forecasting for us easier or no better or easier than anybody else? I, I would think that would make things easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I know the, the regression model is, extremely well fitted, you know, the measures of fit that we use are in the 95, 98 percentile range. So it's not a difficult um, system to model. Okay. But, but are you, Sean, are you aware, maybe I'm reading Mike's report wrong, but January and February, the model did not work. The model was seven or eight times worse than what you're talking about. So the data I have is that it's up on screen here. I've got three years worth of history, just like I, I showed you in January of the, of the budget. And, um, and again, this is load, not revenue. Uh, and I say load specifically because it's also not equivalent to retail sales as we measure it in KWH, but um, tightly correlated, just a different number. And you're right, that red line is 6% higher uh, year to date than forecast. No question that we're load so far so 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 that would argue that our revenue also is is with with whatever with the billing lag the revenue ought to be higher i can't see that number but yes yep so the loads okay. the loads are the loads I'm, I'm trying to understand when we talk about january is that from the bills that were issued for January. And uh, um, in other words, is there the same billing lag on loads as there is for revenue or? I have the luxury land of dealing with calendar months and that's what you're viewing here. Uh, retail uh, sales or deal with those billing lags. Right, that, and, um, and our financials, those are our billing months. So, so what we bill on the first or the fifteenth, which would have some rev some usage from the previous month, the whole previous month, and some of fifteen days of the previous month and fifteen days of the current month. Okay, so the load the loads in in this graph then are based on um, purchase power plus whatever Wolcott generated that month, basically. Is it's the purchase power number, yeah. We've it's, adjusted it's, for what? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you said it's just the purchase power number? Yes, we've adjusted for the behind the meter generation in this number. So yes, it includes Wolka. Yeah, okay. Thank you, yeah. All right, you. let me try to frame the question a, a different way. Um, in Mike's report, the last two paragraphs, the, this is the, the Hardwick general manager's report, which Sean, I don't think you have, but at any rate, you can absorb it. Year-to-day revenues for January and February are 10% over budget, okay? Now that's great. And expenses are 1.4% under budget. So like any board of commissioners would normally say, what you, you know, that's just awesome. That's great. Um, but it begs the question then, it leads down to the final paragraph, which says, and that, leads to a coverage ratio of only 89%. So then someone who's not an expert like me asks the question, so oh, what? You know, how much does that matter if we've got a budget that's low? And then the next question is, so should I assume that the whole year has the potential to be 10% over budget and with a coverage ratio of 89%? I don't have any basis to know that that's not the path we're on because we just had two months at that level. Does that matter? 
it doesn't feel like a very good budget if that's going to be the it case. Matters. Um, so I want to validate your concerns. It definitely matters. Um, the volatility that I am accustomed to seeing on a monthly basis is those numbers don't alarm me at all. I, I see those kinds of changes due to water levels or freeze ups, uh, depending on the system. And we are, by the way, in a dry cycle. There is not a yeah, hydroelectric facility in New England that is operating anywhere near its historical averages. Uh, and that's not just a feature of this winter. This is going back into last summer as well. So, yeah, your coverage ratio is a little low, but it isn't just a function of load forecast error. It's also a function in this case of Walcott being like its okay. neighbors. Which, got it. um, Which kind of, as you yeah. said, begs the question of, of actually incorporating that weather model, that adjusted weather model into budgeting because yeah. the indications are that uh, we're on a, this continuing yeah. dry cycle. It's going to be dry this year. Yeah. So I will, I'm not going to confuse you with another spreadsheet in part because I don't have it up, but VEPSA operates on a uh, very specific policy for managing its coverage ratio every month. So every month late in the third week, there is a meeting between myself and Heather and Ken Nolan and, and typically James Gibbons comes along and the whole topic is energy coverage. It's what is that ratio going to be? Yep. We look at the most recent month's actuals year to date, see where we've been coming in. We look at the load forecast and how it's been changing. And that's been a big point of emphasis because of COVID. Um, your system has been relatively stable, but as you know, there's been a lot of changes in load this past year. So the very first thing we do is, adjust for the load trends we're seeing. And I'm using the word adjust because there's a lot of, a, of judgment that that group of people is, is using. Yes, it's informed by data and trends, but there's no hard, fast rule that we're following month to month with one exception. Our whole job in that power supply policy is to get you within plus or minus 5% of 100. Okay. Okay. So we, we're obligated to bring you with the best of our forecasting and judgment into that plus or minus five range. After we've adjusted for load, the very next thing we look at is hydro. And that's pretty quantitative at this point. When we see a dry cycle, even when we don't, we tend to plan for one standard deviation lower than normal. So in case it's dry, we don't leave you short. So we're always biasing right. our um, coverage ratio to, to at least 100%. And that's true mostly in the winter, Roger, because wintertime prices are the most volatile in New England. And we just saw that this past February. February's energy prices will double what January's were, simply because it was cold. Um, you know, um, what's your SD? Uh, is it uh, 1.5? Or what, what is the standard deviation for? for production? <laughs> I'm laughing. It's an outstanding question, but we measure standard deviation by month and it is all over the place. Okay. Um, that's Absolutely. just a feature of, of Walkit and any other run of river hydro. It's uh, a monthly answer to your question would be the most accurate. And it's very certain in, in August and September when there's not a lot of water and it's all over the place the rest of the year. So, so, but uh, on an annual basis, you're talking probably 35 to 40 percent. You know numbers. That's exactly right. Yep. So, so if our year, if 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 our our demand is up, the way it's been in Jan Feb, and our year is dry, so Walcott is is down relative to normal, how much does that matter? Well, I'll put it in context for you. Wall kit, the way we budget it is somewhere in the neighborhood of, what, 32, 3300 megawatt hours a year, Mike? Something like that. And your load is about 37,000. So it's in I'm the sorry, neighborhood of 10. Up, John, you broke up. Can you say again what the load is? Sorry, I'll, I'll back up a touch more, Lynn. Walkit is in the neighborhood of 3,000 to 3,300 megawatt hours a year. Yeah. Am I coming through? Yeah. 
Thank your you. total load, just to go back to your budget, is this number here, the way I see it. It's about 37300 So you Walk it's a little bit less than 10% of your portfolio. So if you have a dry year and Walk it produces two-thirds two of what it's forecast, you're, yeah, you're going to be off, but not, not terribly. And just to give you a picture, because I've got this uh, behind the meter standard deviation there's Walkit. Hold on, let me zoom in on that. I'm going to try and hide this guy here because he's confusing everything. What you're going to see here is blue indicates wet and red indicates dry. Hmm. And this is the historical time series I'm using, and 1 through 12 of January. Determine your energy coverage every month. So what, what I'm doing later this week is I'm going to be forecasting May, which for Walk it's a pretty wet and consistently wet month. But the standard deviation is still 30% of the mean. Yep. And that's one of the easier months to forecast. <laughs> so um, yep. wow. we always buy you to the dry side when we're buying and selling energy every month. So what you're, but what you just said is what ma to the coverage ratio, what matters more than well could, could be this year, the amount of demand we've got. That's could that. be, yep. Well, it, I mean, it, if, we're as, if, if we're as wrong in future months as we were in January and February, we're going to need a lot more electricity to meet the demand. And it, every yeah. indication is that well could will be a little short. Any chance the uh, day ahead market's going to be less than uh, long-term contracts? Oh yeah, there's a whole other picture exactly like the one I showed you with standard deviations around price. That's this history here. And, uh, <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, I can take you guys right down the rabbit hole if you're interested. <laughs> no, but you know, you, you got to guide us to the right simplified way to think because you're not going to make me and probably all of us experts, maybe Lynn will get there, but and the time we have for this call. So it's a matter of, should we screw around with the budget or should we leave it alone and just understand how much plus or minus risk we got? Yeah, so let's, fortunately, may, our, fi our financial position this year is, is better than it's been. So we can handle the plus or minus, um, but we ought to have our eyes open as to what it is. Because it looks like it's, it's gonna be big. Well, history yeah, has been. If I had a choice between being too much revenue or too little, obviously we'd all choose too much because you're not worried about a rate case. And what we just got done discussing is the process BEPSA goes through monthly to make sure that if your loads are consistently running too high, we've got a process in place to observe and adjust for that. Um, you know, right here in this little column here for loads, I put adjustments that are often non zero. And if I see Hardwick here, and I want to add 7%, I will make the adjustment uh, to your load and move on through this analysis. So yeah, I'm not worried. Great. Um, I like this. This is great. Yeah, so what I was going to say, Sean, is uh, the year or maybe two years before you joined BEPSA, we had a really bad, we got clobbered in the winter. And BEPSA assured us, oh yeah, we're by the end of the year, we're going to make up for it. Everything's going to land good. And we did. We were like right at budget. Right. So what's what's kind of your long-term view on this, Sean? Well, I have two thoughts, Mike. Don't don't let me skate away from your question because I want to answer it. But I also want to acknowledge what you experienced two years ago is exactly what Swanton is, is experiencing today. Two-thirds of their electric supply comes from one hydro, and it is bone dry, and they have had huge budget variances year to date, talking 40% a month. Wow. So, um, I hear you. It's painful. And they're in a relicensing year where their expenses are higher than average. So we've already had a couple of calls with them to reset expectations. Um, so moving forward, where are things going to go? Um, prices are really, really low and really tame. I don't think you're going to see any blowouts on price for the rest of the year. You've already seen a February that was much higher than average. You've absorbed that. Um, I'm not worried about market side risk. Load side risk is, is an upside for you. You're already seeing more revenue. Um, the economy's 
bouncing back. I occasionally listen to these Moody's analytics forecasts of economic behavior and where we're going to have a V-shaped recovery. What's it going to look like? Everything's pointing quick. high. Yeah, everything's pointing it high. It really is pointing high. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, so, so. yeah, especially heavy, heavy electricity use, uh, like manufacturing, industrial, is high. So I, I, I know this is, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I know this is a separate discussion, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the one of the other potential solutions for balancing out the the, the demand the demand curve from hard electric is storage, and you know that's uh, I know there isn't much going on, but I know in the long term, as I saw New England also has big plans for you know distributed generation and and large capacity storage. So anyway, how do you, do you see that being incorporated uh, in uh, basically evening out uh, evening out the uh, buffering? The demand, the, the the entire use curve. I would say no. We just we had this whole presentation with Sean about that that showed that that's not going to be a player in our near future. Okay. I, so I, again, I think we we need to. It's 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 six o'clock already. Yeah, we separate discussion. To, yep. We need to focus on the on the proposed budget for twenty twenty one. Yep. Well, so what's the best what's the best way to put a ribbon around this, you know, for have, us as a group, Lynn, you know, I don't think I have any, I've, I've articulated my concerns and just my desire to understand the implications. I don't really have a number. I was kind of hoping to have a number in my head, like, you know, if our coverage ratio is through the year, but I understand it's complicated because so what, what do you have to pay on the market for what you're not covered for? And is the market high? Is the market, it's so hard to know that I'm sort of accepting that I'm not going to know it, but it looks to me like we are approving a budget that is going to be very significantly low on revenues. Revenues are going to come in much higher and that's okay because that'll make it an easier year. And I, what I hear Sean saying is don't worry about the coverage and the cost side. It'll be okay. Is, yeah. that, how, is that how others feel starting with Lynn? Well, I would rather be conservative on revenue than, you know, if than 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 otherwise. Um, I mean, because one thing that we don't have in this budget is a contingency. Um, yeah, we've got our cash reserve as a contingency. Yeah. Right, and we we'll, we can talk about that when we talk about yeah. the cash flows, because I had some questions about about that. I mean, I look at the at the breakdown um, of. I look at the total number and I agree. It seems, it seems to me that even with the um, adjustment, because when you say, when, Sean, when you say that the 2021, 2020 was an outlier, it was an outlier low, not an outlier high. Not for us. In the spring, that was true. The summer was actually quite hot, and if you look at the summer I, months, I, Okay, I was just looking at the actual numbers, and the actual numbers are lower than what was budgeted and lower than the actuals in 2018 or 2019. Yeah, okay. I don't have them memorized, forgive me. But yeah, he doesn't have those numbers. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at, 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 at 5.89 million for 2020 actual. Whereas Sean 20, doesn't have any of that. No, well, that's why I'm saying it out loud. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and 2019 was 5.97, and 2018 was 5.94. So we're talking something that is, you know, in, in round numbers, almost 80, you know, almost, it's not a huge amount, but 2020 was, was, was actually about 80,000 less if I did my subtraction right. A little less than a hundred thousand less than than what it sort of was running over twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen. Sixty, seventy thousand I guess. But now we're forecasting something that is another hundred and seventy thousand less 
than what we even observed in 2020. Um, and so that difference is not coming from and increased it's net gonna be, metering. And if you, if you change the net metering, it's gonna go down even lower. If you did, but but where where I see the 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 big fall offs that I see, in terms of the difference between 2020 actual and 2021 proposed, is um, is in non revenue st is is in residential. Yeah, and and I don't know why logically we would expect residential to be lower. And um, January and February is confirming. Well, to the extent, I mean, the one thing that is, is that it, it, that it was, it's still high. I mean, I could, I could expect it to be somewhat lower because if people go back to work outside of their homes, they may be using less electricity than, but, I don't know. Um, and there's some other things even embedded in there. The industrial drop is fairly substantial. And I don't know if we've actually lost, permanently lost customers or not. I, you know, I understand the businesses were shut down, but. Is, yeah, is I don't know of any, any industrials or commercials that closed. So, so if people are going to be back in business, I would expect that number to go up, not stay flat. But it's, it's, it's very hard to know. But overall, I would rather be conservative on it. Um, let's, let's go down to 3 million then. <laughs> I didn't kidding. say silly. I just said conservative. <laughs> I know. Um, but... The risk here that's, that strikes me is that we underestimate load. Our coverages are lower because we didn't plan for such, for the increased load. And that prices wind up being high. And so we have to cover in the spot market at a very high price. And so we and, want to be talking to Sean. we're not Texas, but, um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to bring the evil eye down um, either. So that strikes me as, as where we're potentially vulnerable, but we still have an awful lot of load under contract, under long-term contract. Yeah, so, can, 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 um, can you just go, go over what the underlying assumptions are just for the, uh, the res that residential number? What there do you are, mean? Yes. There aren't yeah. underlying assumptions. Yeah. What, if I understood, Sean, the, the, it's, it's a, some kind of a factoring off of the yeah. overall forecast. And if you okay. just eyeball it, we're just okay. ignoring 2020 events and we're plugging right. a number. We're using, you know, a sophisticated uh, technique to basically budget at about the 2018, 2019 level. We're just going back to 2018, 2019, plus or minus. That's I all we're doing. Like that, was, I think it's worth looking at that resource. Michael? Michael, couldn't you say if we go back to 18 and 19 and use those numbers, they're much higher than 20. So if you just take 20 out of the picture completely, it kind of skews the numbers up a couple of hundred thousand for everything. When you compare it to 18 and 19. No, it's, 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 it's less than a hundred thousand. It, it's, it's, it's about. No. Residential 19 is 38.89 and proposed is 37.48. I'm sorry. Where are you? I'm looking where at are you? I'm we're looking on, we're on item, item 44001. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just looking at the summary page. Summary at schedule 11. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, there's so many ins and outs, Michael. That's why we're working on the the 44001 line because okay. there's a fair amount of noise coming in and out, including the net metering. John, I think it's worth but, sharing. But, but that. Michael has highlighted something that's interesting. What is the difference? So, so the line that's residential here, in the summary, 
would be residential farm and home, residential seasonal, and residential net metering, or not residential seasonal. Well, that would all be rolled into one class. You're right, Lynn. So the 2020 actual would be 422 or 423 less 320, which would be 3. Point, would be 3.9. Yeah. So that's that's okay. So, so I don't, I don't have an, a need for, so I, I kind of wasted all this time. It wasn't a waste for me. I, I don't got think, I don't smarter. think it was a waste. I think, yeah, it was I got a lot smarter Lip, being able to listen to Sean and understand and just have some reassurance that by, by budgeting low, we're not walking into a problem where we're going to say, geez, we should have, could have, would have done something different. It sounds like we're budgeting low. We know it. And and the implications don't seem outside of what we can handle. So Sean, if you wanna go over that resource chart, I think that would be worth doing. And if you could answer the second half of the question I gave you of where you think we're gonna land in December, you know, what, what you expect comfortably, conservatively, that would be worth sharing. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with your second question because apparently I forgot it already from the first time around. You already answered my first question. Well, this, okay. Um, where are we going to land? The uh, trends I'm seeing on market prices are, are falling right in line with budget. We've already had our surprise month in February. Um, unless we get an unusually cold start to the winter, I don't expect surprises on the price side at this point. Low trending high. Uh, that could be the makings of a very good year for you. I can't explain your load variance with weather by itself, not just weather. So um, as we get deeper into the year, you'll pick up the phone to you, Jess, and you, Mike, and just uh, talk some. Um, so that's the revenue, that's the load. The, the other variants were, well, it's not a variance yet. Your solar project is budgeted to come on July 1st, I think, is where we left it, somewhere in the early midsummer. I think that's right. That's correct. That is a, that's something to watch. If that moves around by a month or two, particularly in the sunny months, you'll see some dollar variance there. Um, and that's a complicated variance to discuss because it's a, it's an increase in the power budget, but it's a decrease to your red, your renewable energy standard budget. So. Um, We'll have to watch that through the third quarter of this year as that becomes known. Like I said, I'm not, not feeling nervous about your budget position here just from a process perspective. If you were to run high all year long, you're facing a market that's pretty low and we just got through the volatile part. So I'm not uh, thinking your power budget is going to be terribly off. And Sean, do you think this is going to be sensitive to interest rates that, that the power market, because the stuff that I've seen just very recently is starting to talk about interest rates going up? Um, uh, admittedly, I, you know, that it was a very, it was a very Here's foggy. Here's what I'm worried about. I'm going to say no to your question. I'm not worried about interest rates, but I will pontificate around what I am worried about. The Wall Street's willingness to lend money to exploration and production companies, talking oil and gas now, has changed. Um, mm -hmm. They are not willing to invest the same level of money in new production. And that worries me for the latter half of the year and the next year. We're seeing a big rebound in demand and economic activity. At the same time, we're seeing a kind of a depressed investment cycle, if you will, in the oil and gas production capacity. So I don't see that manifesting really in 2021, but I worry about it in 22, three. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. that's related to interest rates, Lynn. I don't know what the stew looks like there at the macroeconomic level, but it's uh, the part of my brain went when I heard your question. Yeah. Yep. 
So also, Sean, another, another thing to touch on is that um, you guys are literally in talks of filling in, uh, replacing this last nuclear chunk with either another nuclear chunk or some more hydro or you're looking at options. But uh, the replacement cost of that nuclear block that we see there is likely going to be a little less expensive than that nuclear block, which is very cheap. And it's probably going to have some type of rec credit benefits. It's going to help us as well, correct? Yeah, and there's a couple good things that have happened. You've mentioned the first one. We've The reason that hasn't moved as fast as I wanted to since I last talked to you, Mike, is because of another piece of good news. The New York Power Authority, those volumes are going up oh, by roughly 10%. Yeah, so this chart, I put it together last week, and it's stale already because that bottom resource, New York Power Authority, is, good, is a little thicker than it was. I'm going to repeat what cheapest Mike just said. Resource. It's cheapest, it comes with wrecks. Um, so I have to recalculate the, the gap at the top here before we go out to market again. But um, yeah, we're, we're trying to take advantage of the, of the low price cycle that we're in. Because right now, it's not different than December. When we got into the discussion around buying the Brookfield contract, market's pretty much at the same place. 23 through 27 looks really good to me right now. Beautiful. I'd like to buy it. Great. So yeah, as far as us covering, you know, the the rough start to the year, I I personally have zero concern about it. Great. There's a lot of good things brewing that are going to offset forty or fifty thousand dollars real quick. <clears throat> well, I appreciate all of this discussion. I think it has been very useful. I was particularly impressed by the fact that. The standard deviation fluctuates to a remarkable degree, and that just makes me appreciate the good work that Vepsa does in uh, looking at all this stuff. I mean, I just was amazed to see a, a standard deviation doubling. Yeah, yeah, it did. Sometimes it's, uh, in any case, uh, it's far more complicated. Than, I knew it was complicated, but it's even more complicated than that. It's fun. You just, it's never boring. <laughs> I can see that it's very challenging and therefore it feels good unless you really blow it. So Mike, are you, are you and Jess going to look at the net metering calculation stuff? Yeah, she's already shooting me notes here behind the scenes right. that you guys aren't looking at. So she's already working on it. Okay. And by the way, that's going to reduce our budget, but that's okay. <laughs> At least it's accurate. Yeah. The truth. Um, did you have Did you have other things, Roger, on the budget? Nope. Well, the only the only other super quick comment was the cash flow picture of this is, you know, we're we're appropriately since we're in a good cash position coming into the year, our capital spending it's a year to spend spend more than average. And, um, and that's good, as long as the projects are good, which they certainly look super good. Um, but, you know, we, we're going to dip into our cash reserves pretty substantially. You know, we're going to start the year uh, and, and then end the year much lower. So the budget, in effect, when you take into account capital spending, it's going to be a year of investing. So uh, that's great. And we're lucky to be in that position, um, but we got to recognize, you know, we're we're funding our our capital spending through other sources than the operating budget. Yeah, I I, and I, I think I'm hoping we're going to be doing more of that in the future. But yeah, and actually, with the you know impending inflation, it might be a good year to borrow some money to do a couple of these projects. Well, Could be if they're really good there. projects, we should. Yeah. Well, if it's long, if it's long term stuff, if it's you know, that's the kind of thing that it makes sense to borrow for because it's not just our current rate payers who benefit. It's it's right. uh, it's our rate payers down the line, and in fact, that that makes it the right thing to do, not um, rather than than making people now pay for all of it, and mm -hmm. they wind up paying for more than their fair share. 
So I, I, I think as a board, then a key activity for the next few months, Lynn, is, is working with Mike to identify um, all the potential capital projects. Yeah. I had a question on the, on the, on the cash forecast. Um, so do we, do we still need Steve and John? We still, I think no, I, we I, have, I have some budget questions, but I think they're all on the expense side. Okay. Uh, so I think um, there might've been one, hang on. I'm reading my notes now, but I don't. I'm going to make it official here that I'm starting to get parts. Uh, oh, I had one question about that. So, yeah. Um, 92305. 92305. Um, which is on the expense side, but it was for VEPSA and it went up by 18% if I did my arithmetic correctly. And I just wondered why. What was it again, Lynn? Sorry. Uh, 923.05. Let's see that. I'm not looking at 923.05, but things that are driving uh, or that would add expense to us at BEPSA this year are uh, that we added an employee who is working up at Project 10 on capital expenditures and other support uh, up there. We also added a GIS technician. So that's another full-time job. Uh, and there's one more, who was it? We've got, we've got uh, AMI, GIS, and yeah. um, AMI uh, project has cost. Those, okay, so these were for specific studies. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Now, I yeah. just, I saw what was written there, but I didn't yeah. know exactly what the it last, meant. So. The last one, when the uh, AMI project, we actually hired a, consultant to help us through that project. who's done multiple AMI projects with other uh, entities such as VEPSA, her name's Jackie Lemmerhurt with Lemmerhurt Consulting. She's been great and a great resource and uh, things have gone very well. Good. Um, just a quick aside, uh, Sean, do you have any idea how the, the infrastructure bill may affect implementation of, AM, uh, of AMI and uh, like- I, I can speak to that. Okay. So uh, the we, when we started talking about doing the uh, business case for models for each of the VEPSA um, municipalities, uh, I cornered Ken about this, Ken Nolan, and I said, you know, Ken, I said, when I first joined VEPSA, you came and did a presentation for all of us from Burlington Electric. You guys had just finished your AMI project and they said, I remember writing down what you said, which was, if you had not gotten federal money, Burlington Electric would have never done an AMI project. And I know that was also true for Green Mountain Power and I know it was also true for CVPS. Um, and I asked him here at this meeting then just, just recently, I said, you know, it seems to me that we need to pull the same card. And there's a lot of money floating around out there and we ought to be trying to play that card. Uh, and Ken was very much in line with that thought process. He had already actually had a meeting with Peter Welch. Uh, and he is, he is playing that card to try and get us, I believe, uh, 6 million federal dollars to help fund this a uh, VEPSA AMI project. Uh, I think I wrote 16 letters last week to our legislators uh, along the same lines. Um, so we're trying to say, hey, the past president precedent is X, that is X, is X, where is this advantage, and we should be allowed to be allowed to see the past president. Past president. Uh, so we are trying to play that in. Right. In, in my checkered past, I, I actually did some lobbying. And, um, <laughs> One of the things that I learned is that um, folks in Congress care about voters. They don't care about customers. And if this is something that is important to us, it strikes me, this is, this is not a budget issue per se, 
that this is the kind of thing that we should be getting information out to our customers about and getting them to be writing letters to um, the congressional delegation and not just coming from I, I absolutely agree utility I mean, the problem, GFs. The problem being you know we found out that Peter Welch wanted letters back in two days or you know for this committee <laughs> hearing so we did the best we could do but I absolutely agree with you and this lines up with Roger's suggestion on adding money into the budget for some outreach but this one really was a time constraint that I, I don't I don't know how we would have met the timing but anyway yeah you're, you're both right Okay, but I, I, I don't have anything else for, um, for VEPSA. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank Always you. nice seeing you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening Thank and a good day, Mike. Stay well. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Enjoy, Mike. Okay, I, I do have, uh, Roger, did you have other questions on, on, on the budget? No. Did Michael, did you or yeah, on that same page, uh, 926.5, there's this pension charge. It looks like it's alternate years. Is that what that is? We pay money toward the pensions every other year. 926.5. Oh, that's I'm one not of the ones, Mike, that uh, the our I think I'm mean, doing this correct. Yeah, pension for Venus. Yeah, so our newest auditors that just did our 2019 work and we're starting our 2020 work, I believe, first of next month, uh, they had us move those dollars into a dedicated account, correct, Jess? And that went into some other number. Yeah, it went from the 926.01 account to, they broke it out to 926.50. So that's why it shows up in 2019. We didn't have anything in 2020 because we haven't done the adjustment yet. Okay. Okay. So to answer your question, Nat, that I just got, yep. that is a re that's a refund on. So if we give you a two dollar estimate uh, to build you a line and it comes in at a dollar, we have to give you a dollar back. Do you have anything else, Michael? No, I had other ones, but uh, they were answered already in the emails. I don't think they're, and I saw yeah. them already covered. So I think I'm good. Thank you. Let's go with it. Uh, well, I have, I, there are a few places that I had questions, and, I, and also where I think maybe we should be adding something. Um, yeah, um, Mike, you had mentioned to me about this boat for Wolcott Hydro. Yeah, that fell apart. Oh, OK. That, that takes care of that question. Um, and Although the, we, should, we should, if you wanted to just get it on everybody's radar, I think that's a good idea because I'm still looking. Well, if we're still looking, is it in the budget? No. no. So the $5,000 item. I mean, even if it, so if we get one, it's not going to be more than that. So no, no. Okay. All right. So that's that. So we don't have to worry about that. And the concrete repair that you talked about in your report. That's going to be done in, in this fiscal year or next fiscal year? The Surge Tower Foundation will be done this August, and that's a $75,000 project. Okay, but that's so that's not going to be in the 2021 budget. Oh, that is in the 20. We're in that's 20. In this Sorry. Budget. Yes. So yeah. it, it is in this budget. Okay. Yes. And the other piece won't be until the following year? Uh, the other Wolcott piece is the Sluice Way. And only the bulkhead portion of that job will happen this August, which is and three that, part. And so that's the other in, next year. And you have an estimate for that in, in the budget? Yep. Two. So that part, right? And where, so where does that show up? Those are in my capital numbers. If I can find the right page. Okay, here. so they're showing up in the capital budget, not in the operating budget. That's correct, yep. And, and so do we have anything for the, so in terms of the capital budget. Page 32. Do, right, no, I, I'm looking at it, but, but do, is the carrying charge from that showing up in the operating budget? I mean, the cap, what we're spending is a capital expense should, you know, for capital yeah. expenditure. 
we still need to we still need to have whatever we're spending show up in the budget, right? I I don't follow you, Lynn. No, that's a separate. The the cap, that's not part of the operating budget because right. it is no. capital. It's capital, but the carrying charges on it, if there are any, if if what if do you mean by it, carrying? If there's any A and G associated with it, if there's any um, uh, interest cost, with there, there isn't an interest cost because we're not borrowing money to do it. But um, I don't know if that's significant or not. And if if it is, is it showing up? That's all. No, all I have in there is the projected costs for the project themselves. And it's and and the if it's if it's not a significant amount, that's fine. Um, and that 160, I have about a 18% cushion in there. So okay. Good. Um. Okay. On transmission, um, there was nothing in the budget for transmission operation and overhead lines, and I wondered why. I'm looking for the line. For some reason, I didn't write down the line item, and I'm looking for it now. For capital work. That's okay. I can. I think I can answer that for you. It's the five sixty and and five seventy one. So in twenty twenty, uh, because of COVID, we ended up not doing ten percent of our thirty three nineteen line. We actually rebuilt the whole line in one year. That was a that was a ten year project. We spent $259,150 doing it. Okay. And that was all capitalized. And you, you can see that on the capital budget. Okay. So we essentially have a brand new line, brand new right away, brand new, it's all brand new. So there is so no that, for it. That line should not need anything. Okay. Now, on okay. the same token, I've added another capital expenditure to start tackling the section of the 3319 that we are buying from Green Mountain Power that needs rebuilding and does need some work. And uh, where am I looking for that, Jess? From GMP, I got $80,000 in there for this year okay. to start ch chugging along on that guy. Okay. So um, there is, there will be money spent on transmission, but it's shown here on the capital budget. Okay. Um, on on uh, five ninety five oh two, um, this is it's not it's not a substantial amount, but uh, it's a matter of curiosity. When are we going to finally be rid of all the PCBs? Oh wow! I would say not in my career. Really? No. Okay. No. All right. And the state isn't requiring that. That's. Oh, and that that's typical across the state. Okay. Oh. Any any transformer Lynn that's quote unquote used and useful. So even if we pulled down a transformer off a pole that was 100% Ascarel oil pure PCB, as long as it's in good working condition and we have it in stock, it's okay. We get rid of them because I don't want them in stock and I don't want them going back in here. But as far as the state is concerned, as long as it's used and used and useful, we can keep it. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the customer services budget um, and, and two things. Um, one is what Roger had already alluded to, which I, I think would probably go under um, customer service education, um, is putting in at least something for that. I don't if, you know without, if you want to grab a number, Mike. Yeah, give me cost? a number and give me a number. Well, what's it cost to do uh, uh, an insert in a bill? If we want to do an insert in every bill, how much would it cost? I believe it's about sixteen hundred bucks to do one insert. And there's only you know nine months, eight months left that we could do it. So what's eight times sixteen hundred? How about that, Lynn? And then, and, and then put a little money in for your PR person to help. I think to we need to put in a lot of money for the PR person. Yes. I agree. <laughs> that was that was the next one that I was coming to. The PR I think we I think we ought to have a serious discussion with Brooke about that before you get wound up about it. Well, I think there. I think there are. 
but they can be very, I'm, not thinking, very I'm not thinking of discussion. a specific I'm not talking about a specific situation yeah, okay. where we are I'm talking generally um, in my discussion with Alex she mentioned that she's on a regular retainer with Marsville Marsville power and light um, and I'm I you know I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes or go the wrong way here, but I really think we ought to have an executive session with Brooke about that service and that team. Okay. Based, based on information received late last week. Okay, that's, that's fine, but I think we should put something more than $3,000 yep. in yep. for that based on amounts that we were hearing. So it sounds like if we want to have plans to do something with somebody and to do some customer outreach, 20 grand should cover it. So, yeah. Well, it's certainly better than what we have there. Okay. Now, and so. what, what number line are we on, Lynn, specifically? 908.05 so and 908.06. Okay. So let's see. Good idea. Want the entire twenty in the in the public relations, or do you? How do you no, want to split that up with no, that? No, I do fifteen in the O five and five in the O six. That's fine. Um, in nine oh uh, nine twenty three no nine twenty six oh sorry I can't read my own writing. Uh, nine twenty three point oh four. Uh, there, there was a note, and I just didn't know. What is PPEC slash Zellinger? Kramer, Piper, Piper Edmonton, and Kramer. Oh, Kramer oh, and oh, oh, and oh, yeah, I. Ah, yeah. Never mind. I, I, I don't think of Scott as yeah. Okay. I know. I don't either. I, I should. <laughs> yeah. You should say Scott. Yeah. Um, that's all right. Um, <laughs> Were you able to find out, Jessica, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at 408.30 right now. Um, were you able to find out whether there's an adjustment to the FICA that we have to pay because of the quarantine wages? In other words, that, that we get to, remember I had asked you about the offset? Right, right. Uh, I have not heard anything back. I reached out to um, another utility to, to verify, but I haven't heard back from them. I'll reach out again. Okay, I, I didn't have a chance to sort of look and see what I might have been able to find, but the issue here is there, there was a program, and what's unclear is whether it's still in effect or not, where, first, backing up, under the various federal legislation, we were obliged to pay people if they had to quarantine because of COVID. Yep. But there were also then tax credits that were available. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, okay. Um, if, if, uh, if you had to pay that, so while, so that you could deduct what you had to pay from uh, the amounts that you would owe to the feds on FICA. So it wasn't a tax credit that was tied to income tax. And I just, I wanna make sure we're I'm more concerned about availing ourselves of that than, than, than reflecting it in the budget. If we missed it in the budget. Yeah. That, that, I knew that, though that there was a, uh, but that, where the employees could, could um, opt not to pay their No, their the FICA. employees, no, the employees, is not, wasn't an employee option. This was that the employer gets to pay less to the federal government. For the quarantine time? Yeah. So um, anyhow, that's, again, I, I'm not terribly concerned about it. I can follow up on that one. But, but I yes. want to make sure that we're, if we're entitled to it, we're taking Thank it. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, and just the... Uh, just so everybody's on the same page with the first half of what Lynn said, yes, there 
there was federal legislation last year uh, that said if anybody had to quarantine for a state, a federal state or a local quarantine that kept them away from their regular work hours that the employer had to accommodate that. That's what, that's what those money started as. Yep. And we did. Okay. Okay. And then I'm going to go back. Um, no going back. Yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not going back. I'm not. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we're back in the 900s. Uh, we are at 920.05. And Mike, you and I had spoken about this. And If right. I, I could just speak to that for a moment. Sure. That's not a that's not a number that I was throwing in there as here's the number, guys. It's just a number so that the budget would reflect an increase. Uh, and I I would be a, requesting an increase this year, which I've done every two years since I've been here. This is two years, uh, and I just threw a number in there uh, so there would be an adder in the budget. It's not a set number. It's something you all need to discuss. It's something that isn't really, uh, it isn't scheduled until June 1st. Um, so you have time to think and talk and do what you gotta do about that or not do about that. So I just, I, I was just bringing it up because there had been some questions about it and I wanted to make sure that everybody understood what that was. And I think that being the case, I'm, I'm not troubled about leaving it there because it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't obligate Just a placeholder. It's a placeholder. And so, um, so those, were, those were my questions. I think the other questions that I had 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 been answered. Um, I'd like to come back though. So, well, the cash forecast isn't really part of the budget. Um, so we need, we need to approve a budget. Um, I would like to talk about the cash forecast, but we can do that after after. That. Um, going back, well, I was thinking when I going back to the net metering credits, I had messaged Mike that uh, the two the 165 year was a year that we had caught up on all of our net metering billing. We actually had actually automated stuff, okay. so there was like okay. six months of billing that should have not been there. Got it. So that's why it was 165 and I kept it at the 125 because we had that, that one big billing to catch everybody up for, I think it was part of, part of 2018 and part of 2019. Sounds right, yep. I did vaguely recall that. Where we, we were working so hard to try and get it automated with the with the multimetering and the programming and yeah, SCDC found out Vermont's that metering was a little different than everybody else's. Yeah, but I'm I'm going to be a little bit of a of a pain in the neck about this then. But why then, if that's the case, did the number for the 2020 budget then drop? Because if that if that increase. Because that, that number, that 165 included money from 2018, from bills right. from 2018. Right. No, I understand the 2019 included numbers from 2018. But unless it included very little from 2018, we only had 2020 budgeted at 125 and 2018 actual, which was missing some stuff, was 123. It was all of 2018 for multiple customers or nine, 10 months out of the, for. No, no you're not, no, you're not following what, what my question is. Okay, go ahead. We weren't showing any growth. If, if the 29, if the 2018 number only had part of 2018 in it. Right, so, so 2018 would have been higher. With would the, have been higher. So why was out of it? So, yeah. so why was 2020 
been lower than what 2018 was, let alone that what 2019 was. That's, that's. That, I am understanding your question now. I, Any, I, think okay. it was, I think it was an error originating because of the automation. I that think didn't, so, yeah. Didn't, yeah. We didn't consider the timing and the months and all of that into the projection. We just said projection. Yeah. So it's right. poor, it was poor planning into that projection. Yeah, yeah that's, a, uh, yeah. That's reality. Yeah. So we need, we need to have a budget. And if we are, I'm getting the, con the sense that there is a consensus that we're ready to take action on the budget. If that's if that's the case, then is there a motion to approve the budget? Since you put up with all my questions, I move to approve the budget with the, the I th I think the with the changes we've just discussed. Is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? And those changes are what, so I can make sure that I get it right. I've got them. Mike has them. They're not many. But but to but to repeat, just so we're clear, so it's 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 in the in the record. It was fifteen thousand dollars for education mm -hmm. and five thousand dollars for public relations under customer under the customer service accounts. Total of okay. twenty thousand, right? Is there any, I have a concern. Is there any, is there, does anyone else have any discussion? Cause I'll raise what my concern is if no one else has any other. Uh, the budget that we have has a deficit. It's not a balanced budget. And we just made the deficit a little bit bigger. So now we're at I, a- I, I did that intentionally. <laughs> because uh, because I expect things to happen in the not uh, before December of 2021 and and to allay your concern Lynn you know remember the depreciation is depreciation. it's not a cash item yeah I know I know I know yeah. it's not a cash item you know well that and you know if you take the January and February overage but we have a we have a fork in the road. We either reset the budget with revenue stepped up to where it should be, at least for the Jan Feb overage, or we accept it knowing that it isn't going to be a deficit budget. We also know that we have at least one <clears throat> capital budget item like redoing parts of the, the roof and the carport that can always be put off another year. Right, I have several things I can yeah. postpone. But we were just, I think Lynn and I were just talking about the operating budget. I was talking about the operating budget. Yeah. If we, if we take the money from the capital budget and talk about cash flow, um, but I'm, just, I'm just saying if, if, we, if we believe, you know, if we believe the operating budget and, and we're 30,000 in the hole there, and then we take 800,000 on the capital budget. And you look at the cash flow, we, have a, we don't have any cushion. Well, yeah, we got loads of cushion. We've got several hundred thousand dollars of cushion. Just look at the cash flow statement shows the end of year cash balance. And that's, uh, if we if we spend eight hundred thousand dollars additional, that's factored in. Capital's factored in. So the way the way it walks across is the add back the depreciation since it's a non cash expense. Yeah. Okay. And and then you have a substantial surplus, but then you spend twice that surplus in capital spending, which makes it then. A, you know, makes it a negative cash flow year, which takes your start of year cash balance of 808 and reduces it to end of year 590. I know I so, saw that, but I couldn't get some of the numbers to, to work they, out. No, they do match. I did it. At, 
I, I didn't have the monthly spread, so I just did it on a total year. And that's how it looked. Um, and given our, given that we are starting the year with this 808 balance, it, I, think it, I think it's a very responsible thing to do to step up capital spending. We just have to realize we wouldn't normally oh. be able to do it. Oh, I wasn't. That's right. I wasn't That's arguing right. that we shouldn't do capital spending. That wasn't. That wasn't my argument at all. Um, I, I. I think that we should. And 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 maybe the, maybe the cash flow is a separate discussion. But when I was looking at the bank statements and looking at the cash flow, I wasn't getting. Uh, they didn't seem to be reconciling. They weren't far off, but they were off, and I didn't understand that. Um, but well, look, I think I read our budget as as a responsible place to be. I think it's true with with the view we have of January and February and the likelihood of an overage. We actually, I think, are headed toward. Um, a surplus and not a deficit. And the deficit is so slight, it's kind of like a rounding error. It, it, I, Mike, I, if you've I, got any view for Jan Feb, if I think our, I think our favorability in January or February might make this budget uh, break even. In other words, Lynn. I'm okay, I, I'm okay. I think we do have two months of favorability kind of in the bank, even though it hasn't officially been published yet that will pull this, this favorable. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, is there any other discussion? All those, okay, so uh, hearing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion to adopt the budget with the changes to the customer service accounts? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So the budget passes unanimously. Great. So I would like to ask Jess. I'm looking at the at the bank statements. Why don't we Why don't we have a whole cash flow discussion next month? Next, next like month. That? That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That is fine. But I, I did, this is just with the budget numbers, so there's no January actual or no February actual. And the next so time. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. We that, well, that, that in there and that'll be great. This is solely budget numbers so that I could get everything and make sure the spreadsheet was working correctly so you would see it based on budget. Next yeah, month, we'll have January, February, that, and March. Is that the actual. origin of your that, question, that, Lynn? That, 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 yeah. uh, okay. I missed, I apologize. I missed that. Uh, piece of it so that answers that explains a lot of the variance that i was seeing okay so continuing on in the agenda we have the general manager's report are there any questions or comments yep <clears throat> What page is that on? I'm having trouble finding it now. I keep scrolling. 34. 34. <clears throat> Here we go. Boy, I am sunburnt, aren't I? Yeah, you know, well, you're getting, and you're getting redder and redder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need a cold glass. You're making of water. us jealous, Mike. So you didn't spend enough time down down <laughs> under the water. <laughs> are there are there any um? Questions or comments on the on Mike's report? I said, what's LM, LMP? That is our locational marginal price, and that is at the point where we receive our power from ISO oh, that's New England. Right. That's right. Okay. Right. Is this the, is this the time to discuss <clears throat> the conclusion so far, Ray Crasbury, or is it not the time? Well, uh, what I can tell you is that the uh, hearing officer provided his recommendation to the yeah, PUC. Yeah, I've read uh, that. And the parties had an opportunity to comment on that recommendation, and those have gone to the PUC. 
So there is nothing left except the PUC ruling. And uh, Eli said he didn't expect that probably till the first week of May. Do you have any idea what happens if the hearing officer's recommendations are accepted and we do not have the ability to- Let's not have that discussion. That, that's, a, that's a legal discussion vis-a-vis -vis litigation. Let's not have that. If you want to talk about it, we can. We can go into executive session. That's how I started. I asked, can we discuss it? Okay. I won't. We can't. Oh, yeah. I mean, we'll, we we'll know a lot more once we get their ruling, and it, it will tell us whether we need to have a further discussion, as you just said. <laughs> okay, that's good. Any other questions or comments? I had I had a couple of questions on the uh, this escrow account with Marsville Water and Light. Yeah. How much so money? So what's are we going on? What what's is going what is on? that? Yeah, what's going on is uh, Morrisville Water and Lights manager, general manager and I, uh, actually the general manager had approached my predecessor about this uh, GMP purchase and buying into the Morrisville Water and Light system as a joint owner back to the Belco Stowe substation to complete this 3319 deal that I've been working on. Uh, last December, uh, that general manager retired. And now there's a new general manager in Morrisville Water and Light who is, uh, has a lot to learn and is honestly overwhelmed with what's on her plate and not in a position to tackle this. Uh, so she wants to hire a consultant to walk her through this with me and uh, so I talked to her as well as Eli because they use Eli for uh, regulatory stuff. And I said, well, is there a way? And, and ultimately, here's the problem. So Mike Sullivan is going to buy this line from GMP for Arctic Electric. And the sooner I can get off the GMP Schedule 21, which is their transmission tariff with us, the sooner I can start getting service directly from Delco at Stowe and save us that $170,000 a year. Now that Morrisville had already agreed with, with Hardwick to let us use those savings to pay into our joint ownership. So instead of us paying Green Mountain Power, we'll take our savings and fund this purchase as to a joint ownership in their facility. That's the deal that needs to get set up. Uh, that's the deal that she's uncomfortable making. She doesn't have uh, operations or technical uh, background to have those discussions about line capacities and stuff. So she wants to bring somebody in uh, to do that for her. So my problem is I want to get off schedule 21 yesterday. So I said, is there a way where we can set up an escrow account where I put $50,000 a year into this account or what have some dollar figure in that uh, represents that we intend to make a deal and therefore I can get off schedule 21. I'm already funding whatever that deal will be. Um, and those, that's where I'm at with her. I'm trying to work out the details of how we set it up in the interim. Okay. Um, couple of things. So, so we're going to be paying so, so the, the whole transmission thing to save the 170,000 a year to GMP is not just paying the 80,000 for the line to GMP, it's also purchasing a piece of Morrisville's line. Joint ownership, we're not buying it, we're gonna own it with them, yes. Well, but we're gonna pay for doing that. Yes. Yes, so we are buying, we're, bu we're buying into it. Into it, we're not gonna own it, but we're gonna be joint owners. Well, if we're gonna be joint owners, then we have to be owning. I mean, is this is there going to be a separate entity set up to own the own the line? No, there's there's joint ownership pole lines and there's sole ownership pole lines. This right now is a sole ownership that we're going to buy into. No different than if the telephone company buys into joint ownership on a line that we have that they don't exist on right now. Maybe they have I'm to buy hung, into that ownership. Maybe I'm getting hung up on what ownership means as, as a legal matter. And, and, and me too. I'm getting hung up on how we use it in the field. 
Um, but you're right. It, we are buying in and being. We're getting an owner joint. We're getting joint use. I suspect we're not getting joint ownership. There may be restrictions on on. I I don't know, but I mean ownership. You have to have. You have to have a vehicle for 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 that in some fashion. But the other thing that concerns me in this is that Eli represents both parties, and that. Oh no! No no no! Eli is representing nobody. We were both just bouncing ideas off him, and if if it gets there, we'll we'll have our own attorney. They'll have their own attorney, and you'll be fully involved, Lynn. Don't worry. Uh, it's not. I'm not as concerned about you know my being full. I mean, we need to have separate representation where there's. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, where there's no yeah. where there's no conflict. Um, One hundred percent. Yeah. But the idea of the escrow then is to get Marsville comfortable that there will be money to cover yes. our share of the costs. Yes. Um, until this is, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Yes. So what, is, what, is, what is the annual cost of this going to be to us? That's what I'm trying to understand. Is this gonna eat up most of what we pay to GMP? No, 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 no. No, so it's, I'm estimating it's gonna be a, a two year payback after which uh, the annual cost, maintenance costs on the line for us will be about $6,000 a year. So after the two year payback, instead of us paying 170 a year, we'll be paying six. Okay, can, can you give us a little spreadsheet or table or a little write up on sort of how, what we're paying GMP, what we're buying, their line for what we're getting from Morrisville, what we're paying them. Yeah, I have a whole general manager's report from three years ago. I'll reprint it, and that's exactly what it. That's does. that's fine, but I don't remember the details and some yep, of the other no people problem. aren't even around that. So, thank you. So the, the the escrow that doesn't satisfy FERC as far as the uh, uh, schedule twenty one goes. Release of the schedule twenty one, right? Yeah, right. and FERC has nothing to do with this. Right, okay. The schedule yeah, yeah. 21 piece, us getting off Schedule 21 is a GMP problem with FERC, not ours. It's we're not gonna it. have we're gonna have to get into Belco's bulk tariff. That's a FERC tariff. Uh, but it's a it's a generic for all participants who are owners of Belco, which we already are. It's 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 yeah, it's a tariff issue and, and it I don't think either one is a problem. No. If we stop taking service, it's it's just we're a customer of GMP. If we yes. stop taking service from them, just like if 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 we if we have a customer who stops taking service from us, they don't have to pay us anymore. They're not taking. They're right. not getting power. They're not getting service. Right. They don't have to pay for it. This is the same right. thing. So that's. Um, it's just a because transmission is wholesale is considered wholesale, and so FERC governs those tariffs rather than the state. Um, the other question that I had was on the Surge Tower Foundation. Um, how, mu how much is that going to cost? Uh, the bid on the project was $73,000. And I put it in for, I think, seventy nine. dollars I added a little bit to it. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just didn't remember roughly. And, and... I never know whether it's blowing coat or blowing cote. I never. Cote. Cote. I got it wrong. Um, but in any case, have they done these kind of foundations before? Oh yeah, they're they're build bridge uh, bridge builders, bridge abutments. All that. they have all kinds of big cranes and heavy equipment and crews. Yeah, they're good. And they have they have. Um, insurance that will cover if oh yeah, yeah. if it fails yeah and we've, and we've seen that that's part of their bid yeah okay they're gonna roll out that old steam power yeah bucket. this this is a this is a actually the the hardest part of this project lynn is removing the deteriorated concrete back to the hard stuff and sinking the new galvanized anchors into the hard old stuff. That is, that's the hardest part of this project without destroying what's there and then pouring all the new stuff over it. 
right? No, when I it's read a real, it, it's, it's a really good product. Back, you know, five hundred thousand pounds of water. When it's and full, we, and we've, and we've yep. talked about the and and this is something again for discuss and and we really need an answer on this. I mean, there were a couple of things I had written myself. The water is diverted at that point. Um, this guy's going to be wearing wetsuits. <laughs> That's 60,000 60, gallons of water. Right, but that won't be in the tower when we're working on it. Right. So, but this, no, what, 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 the reason it caught my eye, and I wondered again, because we had talked about at a previous meeting our insurance coverage if there's a dam failure. And, and also looking at who other utilities use, whether they're using VLCT or, or whether they're using others. And I, I don't think we ever had a follow up on that. Okay. Yeah, that's actually on my, on my list to ask about. So I, I think that, um, I just wanna make sure that if there, you know, hopefully it will never happen that if there is some kind of a failure um, that, that we are adequately covered. Well, with this drying trend, we won't have to worry about it. <laughs> um, those are my only questions. Um, so if no one has anything else. Um, did anybody, anyone have anything on, on the bank statements or anything else? Is there any, sorry, my, my dog is wheezing. Um, <laughs> Looks like everybody stopped moving. What's going on? Your, your dog had, had something to say about the bank statement. Yeah. Um, I don't think we need an executive session today unless there's something that I don't no. know about. Is no. there any other new business that we need to be discussing? And is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, uh, one one um, thing I did want to mention, uh, no, but just before that is is that I, you know, I have not heard back on a date yet for. Um, a meeting with the select board. So I, I will let people know as soon as I hear something, but. Um, and obviously if we hear something from Brooke, you will. If I hear, yeah, no, I, if, will advise. if I hear something, if we hear something, we'll, we'll, we'll get in touch, but. And is so, it, I, I, oh, good, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I just had a couple of little questions. I mean, I would, Definitely, personally, really like to look at the dam, look at H11, even look at 30, you know, look at the transmission line, just uh, because it's nice to see it and have it not be theoretical. Yeah, I would too. I'd join. I, it, I'll join whenever, whenever it's convenient for Mike and you guys. Uh, don't schedule around me, but I'd try to join you if you tell me when you're doing it. Is there going to be any kind of groundbreaking for H11? Or they're just going to uh, start. <laughs> well, the materials start arriving this week. I go down there regularly to Billings Road, take a look around, see if anybody's there. If they are, I wander in. Yeah. Well, I could yeah, see that the they have integrated so. everything. You can see okay, it from, right. from 14. Yeah. Oh, you can see it from 14? Ah. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. yeah I, I had one unrelated question, but it, it probably easy answer. Uh, any reason um, Hardwick Electric or isn't part of any any pool, the New England pool? Uh, is there any advantage, disadvantage to being part of it? Pool. Yep, sir. We, I, uh, we, anyway. Uh, we, we are, we are, what do you mean? Is we it are. Part? We are. We are. That's VEPSA. Okay. Okay, through VEPSA. Okay, got it. Okay. PUC, PUC wasn't on there. As the uh, um, PUC wouldn't be, the PUC wouldn't be part of a pool. 
-hmm. Well, actually, the other, all the other states, except I think Rhode Island, have their governing authority, the, the utility commissions as part of New England Pool. But anyway, it didn't matter. Oh, I, I was just curious. Um, Roger, you had a motion. <laughs> No, I want to stay. I don't, you know, I want to stay all night. I want to see if, if Mike can hold off on the margarita. You got like 30 seconds and I'm turning the computer off. I move to adjourn today's meeting, which was very constructive and action packed. And I learned a lot. And I second because I want okay. Mike to be able to go down to the bar and get his money worth. Nice. So you'll be, you be thinking of us. Any objection? Yep. Hearing none, we are adjourned at 7.08 p.m. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all. Have a great okay, vacation, Mike.